So welcome to a FinchRobot 2.0 playground. Um, I'm Tom Lowers. I'm the founder and CEO of Birdbrain Technologies. And our mission is to inspire deep and joyful learning with creative robotics, some creative robotics that you're going to hopefully enjoy this evening. Uh, with me is Aparna Brown. Aparna, do you want to do a brief inter introduction? Hello, my name is Aparna and we are coming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for coming from it looks like all around the country. Um, I am the director of operations at Birdbrain. We are a tiny company. So what that means is I do a little bit of everything. So probably most of you will receive an email or some form of communication from me about something in the future. So uh, feel free, I'll be answering questions in the chat. Um, and so feel free to ask questions and um, we will get you all the answers you need. We're really excited for the Finch and we're really excited you're here. So thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Great. Okay, so, um, so just to give you a little bit of an overview of what the next hour contains, um, you have the link to the slides right there on this slide. Um, I'm going to introduce the Finch Robot 2.0 to you. So talk about some of the new features, talk about where the Finch came from um, and kind of its journey over the last 10 years. Uh, and I'm also going to discuss remote robots. So that's the technology that you're using to program the robots in this studio in real time over the internet. Um, so I'm calling from uh, Birdbrain Technologies live stream learning studio. This is a studio instrumented with several cameras um, that's kind of set up for online learning. Um, I want to give you a, a few instructions about how to program the robots and kind of what the rules are and things like that. And then for probably about 40 minutes, you'll have time to uh, play with the robots, try out programming them and really get a feel for, for how they act, how they behave, how, what programming them is like. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the Finch. So the Finch came originally from a Carnegie Mellon research project in the late 2000s that was all about developing a robot for computer science education from the ground up. And that yielded the Finch Robot 1, which was released in 2011. And so over the last 10 years, we've had the opportunity to get feedback from literally thousands of people who have used the Finch ones, um, and also have seen kind of new technologies, you know, evolve over that time period, right? So if you think about 2010, I think the iPad was released that year. Um, so in terms of electronics and computer technology, a lot has happened in the, in the last 10 years. So we decided a couple of years ago to um, update the Finch hardware and create the Finch Robot 2.0, really taking into account all of that user feedback and taking advantage of all of the new technology that's out there. And so the mission of the Finch 2 is the same as the mission of the Finch 1, which is to bring computer science to life from kindergarten to college. And we really mean that. We try to make it work um, for students who aren't able to read yet, potentially, so with tablet icon-based apps. And we also make these programmable in Python and Java so that you can use them at the college and high school level. We've even lately been experimenting with app programming so that you can create your own apps that control the Finches to get into things like computer vision and AI. Um, so the Finch for new orders is shipping late November or December. Uh, and you can pre-order now. We are, we are in the home stretch in terms of getting them here. They are in the US, um, so they just need to get to Pittsburgh now. And then we will um, test them and ship them out. So we're, we're very close. I'm hoping to be shipping these in mid-November to pre-order customers. So let me talk a little bit about this low floor, high ceiling idea. Um, so what I'm showing on this slide is two different programming environments. The top one is Finchblocks, our icon-based programming um, app for kindergarten to third grade. The bottom is Java code. And the interesting thing about this is that it, um, it, uh, it actually represents the exact same behavior on the Finch. The Finch moves forward and moves backward. Um, and so you can have the Finch create, you know, essentially similar behaviors with vastly different um, levels of programming environments or vastly, you know, programming environments that are appropriate for, for one age or experience level or another. 
And the interesting thing is, at, as you learn and as you unlock these either higher levels within Finch blocks or as you go to more complex blocks based programming or get into Java, what that also unlocks for you is more interesting and complex behaviors and capabilities on the Finch. Um, so, in terms of that kind of low floor, high ceiling transition, it isn't just, you know, icon straight to Java. Um, we actually support a number of different environments. So we start with Finch Blocks, and Finch Blocks itself has uh, three different levels. Level two introduces parameters. Level three introduces some very basic control structures, like um, you know when a sensor is triggered or a repeat ten loop. Then you go to Bird Blocks, which is a scratch or snap-like uh, interface on an iPad or on a tablet, actually. Um, so that's really our own. Uh, kind of homegrown uh, tablet blocks-based programming environment. From there, you can go to computers or Chromebooks and work with either Snap or MakeCode. Um, so Snap is an environment that is based on Scratch 1.3 that lets you merge kind of um, live coding with the Finch with um, graphics animations on the screen. So very much like Scratch. MakeCode is a programming environment that's great in that it is transitional. So it can transition between blocks-based and Python or JavaScript code. So you can basically hit a button and turn your blocks program into Python or JavaScript and change the JavaScript and then hit a button and it'll take you back to blocks. And that is essentially a two-way trend, uh, two-way seamless system, which is really great. Um, and then, like I said, in order to support like high school computer science classes, college courses, you can write programs for the Finch using standard Python and standard Java. So that means the exact same level, type of Python language or Java language that you would use in you know, AP computer science principles or AP CSA um, or you know, introduction to computer science at the college level. So the other thing I want to discuss is the features that we've kind of, you know, managed to get into the Finch. So when it comes to outputs, obviously the Finch can drive around. It has two wheels. It has wheel encoders on that on those wheels. That means that the wheels know how far they have traveled. And what that allows us to do is command the Finch to do specific movements, like move 20 centimeters, turn 90 degrees. That also allows the Finch to draw shapes or do other things like that. Um, the Finch has a beak LED, so an LED in the beak, as well as four LEDs in the tail. All of those LEDs are individually programmable, and they are full color LEDs, which means that you can program them to be essentially any color, so red or green or um, purple or white. Um, there's also an LED array in the tail, so that is um, using the BBC micro bit. And that's a five by five LED array that you can use to print small characters, small emojis. Um, so another way to make your Finch kind of emotive. It has a buzzer, like a multi-tonal buzzer. So that means that you can play essentially 8-bit music and you can make, make different songs on it. Um, and I see somebody has actually started Finch C and is having it play, play a song. This is great, actually, a really good program. Um, so you can see that, I think, on here. I'll, I'll put my phone there so you can see it. Um, lastly, it has a marker holder, which Finch C is demonstrating quite nicely. Um, that's centrally located so that you can draw, draw different shapes. And then finally, we have a plastic brick adapter, which, um, which you can use to mount Legos or other things or other accessories like this cell phone mount that is 3D printable. Um, so things are getting a little crazy in here, which is good. I'm going to keep talking. If I seem a little distracted, please keep programming anyway. Don't stop. Um, all right. So in terms of sensors, we have light sensors, line sensors, a distance sensor. Um, so that really allows you to do lots of different things like obstacle avoidance, um, follow lines, follow a flashlight beam. Uh, it also has an accelerometer which allows you to pick up the finch and detect the orientation of it, um, and a compass. So you can make the finch always drive north or always drive east, things like that. Finally, it has two buttons on the micro bit to, um, to use that. Um, 
So we have a question about the 3D code for the, okay, Aparna's got it, good. So lastly, um, you know, again, integrating 10 years of, of feedback from customers, um, we really thought about the durability of the Finch and tried to make it as durable as possible. Um, so one of the most common use or common failure modes of the Finch one was that someone would step on it in a classroom. And so um, we built this interesting spring-loaded system where the wheels actually retract if you step on these finches. I'm gonna play this, this video again of me stepping on it. Uh, and it can hold my entire weight on one foot and it's fine. So that, that failure mode's taken care of. Um, obviously have tested the other most common you know, thing that happens in classrooms, uh, which is that it drives off a table. So we're, we're good there. Um, and then the last thing is we, we built it with a seven hour battery life so that it would last for a whole classroom day. Um, are they quieter than the original pinches? Yes, they're, they're quieter, but they're not, I wouldn't say they're quiet if they're going at you know, full speed, um, but they are, they are definitely quieter. Um, and then just to go back to that battery life, that's with all the motors and LED lights running full speed um, for seven hours. That's how long the battery would last. And then it comes with, you know, all of the activities, all the learning materials, um, including PD courses for blocks programming. Uh, and all of those are freely available. We really designed the Finch for the classroom. And what that means in my mind is making sure that you have all of the tools, including all the learning materials to use it as effectively as possible. All of that is Part of the pro uh, part of the um, product. So here's just an example, and here's a link to Snap, which is the programming environment most like what we'll be using with remote robots today. And you, you'll be able to see like the program activities and resources that we've already got online now. Okay, and, so and it, Tom, in the chat, I put a link to the portal. But you can always get to the portal from our homepage, clicking Get Started. And so if you want to see any of the learning materials for the Finch, if you're interested in the languages, want to see what we've got, you can click through to those materials now. Yep. All right, so let's see. OK, great. Um, I will. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what remote robots are as well. This is something that we developed back in March and actually works with Bird, both of Birdbrain's products. It works with the Hummingbird kit and the Finch robot. It also works with the original Finch and even the Hummingbird duo and original Hummingbird kit from a long time ago. Um, so the idea behind remote robots is, you know, if you have a, um, if you have a robot or I have some robots here in Pittsburgh and I want somebody on the internet from anywhere to be able to program those. So my family's in Belgium, how do I make them program my robots? Um, so we leveraged something called NestBlocks, which is a Snap-based environment. Uh, so a blocks-based environment that added networking and internet kind of cloud network and message passing um, to Snap. And what that allows us to do is have the projects that you create, like the, the programs that you write, send messages to the projects or programs that are running here, which control the finches. So um, to give you a little bit of an overview of that, you know, you will get a project and in that project link, you will have things like a finch move block. And when you click on that block, that's going to send a message over the internet to a, a, a block-based program running here in the studio. I have one running for every Finch. So I have six of those block-based programs running uh, on two laptops here. And then when that message gets received, it sends a Bluetooth command to the Finch to move. And that's basically how this is going to work. Um, what's interesting is that this also works in reverse. So a Finch sensor can send information to over Bluetooth to kind of this local project and then that sensor data gets sent over the internet to your project. And this means that you can create programs um, that actually use remote robots with sensors. 
So you can have, you could write a obstacle avoiding robot, for example. What's really um, neat about this is that that actually makes these finched robots into Internet of Things devices. So all of these robots are now devices on the internet that you can program. Um, but what's great about NetsBlocks in particular is that it's secure. It's not like I had to open some, some network port or essentially make this setup vulnerable to any sort of uh, hacks or attacks. Um, so, so let's get to it. Let's get to programming. And I see uh, a few of you have already started, which is great. So uh, for those who haven't, I'm going to give you a brief tutorial in how it works. So I'm going to click on this link, which we've created for any Finch playground. And that link has some general instructions for you. And I'm going to click on the link to the Finches. And that's going to open a new project in NetsBlocks for me. Um, every time you click on that link, it, it like creates a new project, a new unique project. So if I am editing this project, it's not going to affect any program that you're editing. Um, you basically have a new copy of it whenever you open that link. So I'm going to connect to a robot by either pressing the C key on my keyboard or clicking on this um, set of blocks. And actually, let me, let me make this a little bigger for you guys. There we go. So I'm going to press here. And it's going to try to connect to the different robots that are here. So Finch A is occupied, Finch B is occupied, Finch C is occupied, D is occupied. Wow. E is occupied. And F happens to be available, which is great. So that's the last robot. So um, so F also happens to be the one that the cell phone is mounted to. So you're going to see that, that view, the Finch PO beam move around in a second. So I have a little sample program that you can start with. So I can click the green flag or just click on this set of blocks, and it's going to make my robot start moving. And it's, you know, doing, it's essentially doing this program now. I can also click on blocks individually and see what they do. So that just turned on my tail lights to green. Um, and I can, you know, edit this program in real time if I want to. So if I, if once I'm done, I can hit X to disconnect. And so now I'm disconnected from the robot, and that gives somebody else a chance to program the robot. So if there were a lot of you, um, what I would be suggesting is that people um, assemble a program, connect, see what that looks like in the camera view, and then disconnect to give somebody else a try. Because even while you're disconnected, you can still be editing your program. Um, so that's kind of a cool feature of this system is that you don't have to be connected in order to be editing or assembling a, a program. Um, but there are six robots, and I think there's six or seven of you. So you probably can each have a, a robot, um, and it'll probably be fine. Um, OK, so that's basically. Well, let me let me talk a little bit more about this page. So, you know, these instructions essentially tell you what I just told you. If you're looking for information on how to use the blocks, there's a description of all the Finch to snap blocks here. There's some programming tutorials that could be helpful. And there's also a few suggested activities, like you could make your robot dance, which I would argue Finch C is already dancing very well, very nicely. Um, you know, you could try to have your robot draw a spiral or, um, you know, uh, draw a regular shape, things like that. Um, one other thing I wanted to say in Snap or in, in NetsBlox, all the Finch blocks are at the bottom of each category. So they're down here. So here's the Finch move block. Um, the LED blocks are down below at the bottom of Finch looks. The sound blocks are at the Play note block is at the bottom of the sound block, and sensing is at the bottom of the sense. So Finch sensors are at the bottom of the sensing category. Um, yeah, that's just about it. So I am going to switch over to a camera view that is um, 
top down. So can you guys all see the top down view of the finches now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so there are two other cameras in the setup. There's, again, there's the camera on uh, Finch F, and that's uh, called Finch POV or point of view. And then there's also another camera that's attached to my laptop that's called Tom Lowers. So if you want different views, you can actually manipulate Zoom to do that. If you're in speaker view or if you go into speaker view and you double click on a speaker or on a camera view that you want to see, <laughs> that's nice. um, then, uh, then it'll pin that particular view. So that's always useful to, uh, to you know, kind of pick the view that you want to see. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, go ahead, start programming. I'm going to wrangle the robots, keep them, you know, keep them from necessarily going off screen or things like that. I'm going to move this too. And I'm happy, Aparna and I are happy to, uh, to answer your questions about programming the robots, about you know, when they will arrive, about how you teach with the robots, really anything. Um, you know, we're happy to answer questions. We're here for that. Um, otherwise, you know, if you have no questions, just program robots. OK, middle school science. So some of my favorite activities. Um, Let's see, I would say, so we've got a few around um, data collection, um, or actually some of my favorites are ones that take the robot and um, use it in ways that, that aren't kind of your classic idea of robot. Um, so for example, um, turn the finch into a hot potato game. You know, so like you shake the finch, you pass it to somebody else, it counts down and you keep it, keep passing it. So using it in, in that kind of a game or using it as like a Simon Says game. So thinking about like the Simon game from the 80s that would light up different colors. You can do something similar where if you tilt the finch, um, if you tilt the finch, like it, it could tell you like, tilt it this way, then tilt it this way, then tilt it down. Um, there's some interesting things you can do in Snap where you create um, uh, like an animation or a game in the canvas. And then you use the finches as an input device to like move sprites around in the, in the canvas. So you're kind of mixing, you're kind of turning the finch almost into a game controller. And then another one kind of along those lines is, um, is the finch alarm clock, which, you know, is, it's pretty simple, but it's like make the finch move randomly, drive around, beep, and then in order to stop the alarm clock, you have to catch the finch and pick it and point it beak up or something like that. One of my favorites that is biology related is animal adaptations. So, you know, the class unit was studying different animals and how they adapt both their behaviors and how their looks to different environments. And so they used programming the finches to um, sort of be a demonstration of what they learned. So they each had different animals and they had to study their adaptations. And then they programmed the finch and dressed them up in costumes and like moved them in and out of habitats to sort of demonstrate their knowledge. So they used computer science as an application of demonstrating what the research they had done was. Um, and so that was great. And this teacher um, took great videos. And so the parents got to see the demonstrations, even if they couldn't come into the classroom back in the days when people could go into classrooms. Um, so that's a, a great uh, one for me for biology. Um, so I, I saw a question about the um, marker. Uh, might spill the beans a little bit here. Um, so the marker is an add-on. Now, what we have in here is just a like Crayola washable marker. You can get five of them for five dollars uh, as a pack um, on Amazon or at Target. 
Uh, so they're, they're widely available and they're our favorite markers right now, although we designed the mount to work with essentially any marker. We've decided as a thank you to put them in all the pre-orders. Um, so those will be kind of coming with the, the, um, the pre-orders, but they aren't intended as a, they are intended as an add-on for others. Yes. I have a question, not really about programming, but about um, the teaching end of it. How do you balance like teaching the technology versus and teaching content? So I think that's a really good question. And I mean, it, it goes back to kind of how, how this was designed in the first place. So when it was a research project, the way we designed it at the time was really around the AP computer science and college freshman sequence. So the typical conceptual sequence of that, at that time, mostly Java programming class. And so we thought about, okay, how do you, how do you teach you know, variables with a robot? How do you teach control structures with a robot? And so we created activities that were, that use the robot that were essentially um, replacement activities for, you know, whatever you would use at that when you hit that concept. Um, so those activities are on our website and they're free. Um, and that's kind of how I imagine like that you can use the Finch essentially to drop into um, really any any sequence and just pick the, the appropriate activity. So you you might have a you know an AP computer science class where you're teaching, um, you know, for and while loops at, at that moment, and we can point you to a good Finch activity that would hit that concept um, that you could use right then. I don't think there's a lot of overhead in terms of teaching, you know, how to use the robot. Um, so I think we've designed it so that like that kind of overhead of, you know, just how do you connect to the robot? How do you use it is, um, is pretty minimal. It really shouldn't take more than 10 or 15 minutes of class time. So it isn't really about teaching robotics necessarily. You can get into a lot of robotics concepts like that are, that are sort of different from pure computer science. Um, but you don't have to, like you really can focus on the computer science concepts and use the robot as an engaging tool um, uh, to highlight those concepts or to practice those concepts. Thank you. I think also when you're thinking about younger grades, particularly, um, you know, people want to bring computational thinking or computer science into their classroom. And so the animal adaptations that I mentioned before or for English language arts, we have something called finch tales where people create a story and then they use the finch to act it out or the finch acts out a story that you read or um, students pick a story, read it and then act it out with the finch. So taking something that is in your curriculum already and then using the finch as a tool to show that computer science or computational thinking is a tool that can engage you in other subjects. Some of my favorites have been music teachers. So we had a great one with um, a jazz unit and they all learned about different jazz artists and they dressed their finches up as their artists and composed a song and had the finches all do a coordinated dance. Um, so I really like those activities where people are using it just to incorporate into curriculum they were already doing and they're just sort of throwing in a little computer science or computational thinking you know, because that's really what it is in our world now, right? It's a tool for other things. You don't just have to do computer science, right? You're using computer science as a tool to do art or express yourself for other things. So I see a question about programming the Finch to speak. So the Finch's built-in buzzer uh, can only really handle like 8-bit music and 8-bit tones, um, which you can actually hear because I think Finch C is, is playing some nice music. Um, some of our environments do have sound recording and sound playback ability. So in Snap, 
or in bird blocks, you can have them record sounds and then they, those sounds come out of the computer or tablet speakers. Um, but it is, a, it, it is a function that is dependent on which specific environment you're using. So like I said, uh, bird blocks and snap have that. Make code does not um, because with make code, you're actually downloading the program to the micro bit and running autonomously and there's not that computer interaction. Um, and then in Java or Python, you can use media computation tools to, um, to play sounds and, and things like that out of the computer speakers as well. And all six robots are busy, so they're all connected. So people are definitely planning their programs. Mm -hmm. Great. If anyone cannot connect to a robot, uh, please just put that in the chat or let us know so that, um, so that we're making sure that everybody is getting a turn. There's sometimes a little bit of classroom management with these where if somebody connects to one and then closes the browser window or something like that instead of before they hit X, um, on this side, the pinch will think it's still connected. So it's easy for me to reset them over here, but I just need to know which ones I should reset. OK, so we do have one person who can't connect. So. If anybody, actually, if I could have everybody in the chat just write which robot by letter that they are connected to. Um, I'll disconnect the ones that nobody claims. <laughs> I thought that was you, Eileen. <laughs> now, I've been trying to connect um, the prototype using the programs like the server programs as well as the client programs. Um, and I'm not getting a lot of success. Um, I've ordered seven, so seven are on the way. Um, am I gonna have to make a separate server file for all seven or does it only go up to like the letter C and then I have to come up with a different computer? It only goes up to the letter C and then you, yeah, and you have to make a use a different computer. Oh, so how are you getting letters D and D, F? Um, so I am using two computers and ah. have projects D, E, F as well. Um, I haven't shared those because it's just, I mean, I, I was worried that like not very many people would want it and it's a little more complicated to set up, um, but I can, I mean, it. it but in terms of just getting yours working in the first place, I think uh, I, I'm happy to help with that. You know, just, just let me know. We can do like a Google Hangout or something or some share screen share. Well, that'd be awesome. Um, we can also tie it into like a computer science honor society induction ceremony where you would be a guest speaker as well as doing remote <laughs> robotics. That would, be, that would be really awesome. <laughs> That was that was well done, Eileen. Yes, yes. I've been. I was, I was thinking about that. <laughs> that was the right forum to ask him in, Eileen. Much yeah. much more effective than an email. Very public forum. Yes, <laughs> and we're recorded. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Eileen, I don't know if you've seen, but we have a little Finch graduation video. I'll put the link in the chat. Okay. Where, I'm it's when it's when the finches passed all their um, testing, all their chemical and electrical and other security and safety testing. We gave them a little graduation ceremony. All right, I'm going to 
make um, B and yeah. All right, so B should now be available. So for somebody who wasn't able to connect before, and I'm also going to make E and F available. Second. All right, B is definitely now moving, so somebody's using it. Great. And like I said, E and F are also, okay, E is, somebody is, all right, they're both moving, great. Can I? And again, if anybody is trying to connect, and I mean, all the robots are occupied right now. So if anybody is trying to connect, let me know in the chat and I'll reset one for you. Uh, can you tell me which is robot E? E is this one. Um, so I don't know if you see the top down view, um, but I've got it right there. Uh, no, I'm in Tom Lawyer's view. So oh, okay. you can you move it a little uh, I'll hold right? Up that one. Yeah, yeah. So here's yeah, the. Okay. I'm going to set yeah. it right there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the top down, it's easier to tell which robots are which because the letters are. Okay, yep, he's moving. So these are Finch robots driving on, is it on paper on this board or no, is it marker board? board? It's whiteboard? Yeah, I picked up some, like you can get these two by four fit, foot sheets of whiteboard material at Home Depot. So it's just two of those taped together. Yeah, I just recently ver um, purchased a large um, reversible marker board that we could put on the ground and it has beveled edges because um, mm -hmm. the swimming pool thing didn't work. So okay. I'm trying to think about um, how to set it up so I could have a similar setup with marker board pens and stuff. What didn't work about the swimming pool? So I, I figured like the bottom plastic might not work well, but like that as a way of creating like a border, it seemed like it should work if you like. <sighs> Yeah, it was kind of, I mean, I have it. I can go get it. The bottom deflated. It had three levels on it. I thought it had one level, but it actually has three. And the bottom part kind of deflated. I think um, we used a um, pneumatic pressure um, pump in order to fill it up because I don't like waiting. <laughs> so I think it popped the bottom segment. Yeah. But I guess I guess I could cut it. I'm not sure. I'll go get it. Yeah, I was thinking like if you like, you know, yeah, if you cut out that, you know, that bottom plastic or make something that fits inside the bottom plastic, probably cutting it out is easier and then putting that on top of like whiteboard material or something like that way you have a quick border. Yeah, the bottom kind of deflated. It just got popped immediately as soon as I brought it home. Um, it has two other levels, but um, I think the beveled edges on the reversible marker board that's on wheels will work really well. Um, I just need um, my football coach to build it. The deal is he gets to use it um, and I get to use it. Like I'll take it off the wheels, put it on the ground like this and then drive the robots on top of it. Um, and then he can use it for whatever football business he wants to do with his and just reverse the sides and stuff. But um, I found some markers at um, Five Below 
and they fit great. Hmm. Yeah, I can share them. I have them over here somewhere. Ooh. Okay, that's a little too dramatic. And those are whiteboard markers, right, Eileen? Dry erase. You're muted. Oops. Anyway, um, they're at five below, and they're actually four dollars at five and below. And it looks like they don't fit, but that's just the cover top with a little eraser on it. But they they fit in really well. So. Um, because I use the smaller ones for the marker board markers and it looks like my finch has had too much caffeine when I drive it around on the board. So these do pretty good, but they only get one color. You only get one color from these. So if there's an Expo one that's a little thicker um, that I can use, like I guess with the Crayola markers, I could use the Expo wipes and stuff like that and it would come up right, um, all right. Yeah, they're washable. Tom, can you, uh show wiping up that whiteboard? Do you yeah. have, I don't know if you have anything in the studio that would um, work. <laughs> you mean? Oh, no, I don't have any. I'll have to go upstairs to get water, unfortunately. Although I do have just a dry paper towel here. Let's see if that. Now nah, you need you need to make it wet to wipe it off. Now we all know that Tom is not hydrating enough because he doesn't have a water bottle in the studio with him, despite the fact that he was doing a webinar. <laughs> but it should come right off, Eileen, because they're washable, yeah. those paintbrush markers, so. I mean, I, I have, this is not the first time that someone's drawn all over this. <laughs> And if you, the fact that you can't see a lot of green and blue, which is what the other markers were, means that I washed it. So it's definitely washable. And the surface of the finch also is, you can draw on the surface of the finch with a whiteboard marker and erase it. So for classroom management, if you don't wanna tape little letters on the top, um, yeah. Your students, no matter how old they are, will find very creative ways of identifying their finch with Legos or craft supplies or anything else. But um, yeah, so we wanted to add that just in case you wanna mark your finches. Yeah, and they'll stick markers on the front and joust with them. And then there'll be markers like everywhere, like on my walls still in my classroom, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, that was the reason that we added um, the, not Lego, plastic brick adapter. I uh, don't want to get into trademark violation there, uh, around the marker hole. So using the marker hole instead of for a marker, for a popsicle stick or a straw or something else to anchor and using the, the plastic brick adapter to put bricks on, we have seen so many creative attachments made for the original Finch that we really wanted to give a robust place to start your building. So Finch jousting, Finch soccer, all sorts of Finch activities that involve, you know, navigating your Finch to a certain place and scooping something up or, you know, there's a lot of, we were talking about science earlier, there's a lot of physics in Finch jousting. So you have different targets and you have to program your finch, right? And that can go from the very basics of, you know, measuring distance of how far does it go if I just hit one block to doing a lot of math, um, you know, and you build something on your finch that sticks up, sticks out, and then you knock a little ping pong ball off the top of a cup. 
right? So you need some cups and some ping pong balls and then the kids can go at it. You can, you know, or you can make ever more or complicated engineering challenges for them if physics is one of your um, middle school science. So you could really engineer, you know, how do you get the finch to knock this off of, you know, something that's taller or something that's hidden behind something, all sorts of possibilities with, uh, with physics. Huh. Now, Tom, when you did the, um, like, when um, we do the remote robots, like in your home, and we see that little video feed, I mean, is there some programming involved in order to get that little video feed? Because what we want to do is maybe something like this, like, and call it the lab, and have it in our classroom and just available for people just to sign in and um, use it during certain times and have that video feed right there instead of zooming. So there's some, the, the big disadvantage with the video feed is that there's a delay, right? You know, if you mm -hmm. use probably see like, it's not as live as with this where you click on a block and you pretty much see it happen with, within a second or two. Um, so with that, it's like a 10 to 15 second delay. Um, now, the way that we have that set up where you see this, the NetsBlocks interface and then you see the video in the corner, um, that did require a little bit of programming like to, to make that kind of work. Not a lot though, I, I'm pretty sure it's just a PHP page. So like since we've done it once, I can probably send it to you. If you know anybody who has a little bit of you know, PHP experience, they can probably set it up. Um, but yeah, the bigger issue is just the, the delay, the 10 to 15 second delay. Um, so you have to ask yourself, I mean, you could just leave Zoom on also and have them join meetings and then they then they would see it immediately. Because the, the difference between the finches and having the hummingbirds as sort of a remote robots is the hummingbirds don't move and they're plugged in. So it's very easy to make them 24 seven, right? Like the only thing that, I mean, yeah, they, you just leave them on and, and it's fine. Um, but with the finches, you know, yeah, you get a day's worth of battery life out of them, but you will eventually have to plug them in. And you will have to keep them confined somehow. Although in a, in a setup like this, you know, in a playground like this with walls, I probably would be fine. I, I would personally be comfortable walking away, coming back in an hour. The robots probably will have moved, but that's probably okay. Because even if you run into the walls or run into each other, it doesn't really hurt the robots. I think the exception might be like, you know, if you have a robot that's running full speed at the wall and it just stays there, like somebody programmed it to run full speed at the wall and now it's just running with its wheels spinning kind of against the wall, that's probably going to wear down the motors and the wheels a little faster. You don't want them to be doing that for hours on end uh, if you can avoid it. So. Yeah, I think it just in general, there's just a little bit more management when it comes to leaving leaving finches in this sort of remote setup um, without any sort of anybody watching, I guess. And I think the big goal, at least for some of my students and maybe myself, is to have it set up where we could do like a finch robot raid on my principal's office yeah so <laughs> that's the big dream that's the that's the big dream like we'd set them up at a remote location we kind of walk away a little bit and then we'd start programming them so they would like sort of barge into his office <laughs> mm -hmm. so anyway yeah I think can, we have, that. can we have a robot day like that where we're gonna barge into somebody's office with the robots with the cameras and everything Yep. Yeah, you put a smartphone on one of the, the robots, put a smartphone on one, so you've got a camera view. And 
that could be fun. All right, we have about um, two or three more minutes left in terms of programming time, and then I'm going to wrap up. So if there's anything you want to do, um, do it now. Run it now. See what it looks like now. Um, and I'll start wrapping up at 7.58. So, so Tom, uh, I'm trying to put some code here, but I think the robot C doesn't move. It only shows some uh, E, yeah, E. Uh, it it just shows some signs, but it doesn't move actually. Not this one. This, this. Uh, the one in the front. The one in the front on your. Um, this one A or E. Yeah, this one. This one. Yes. Okay. So yeah, it hasn't moved in a in a little bit. It's its tail lights are on. I saw it move forward and back. Um. Uh, what are you having it do right now? Oh, it's, it has simple uh, finch move forward, backward, turn right, and finch move. But it doesn't do anything. Oh. And it has finch tail, all, R0, G, 100%, and B, 0. OK, let me try. Let, let's just see if i um, resetting it. So I'm, I have uh, restarted the project. Oh no! Did you just try uh, reconnecting? No. It when I click uh, uh, when I click, it says uh, it's already connected to a robot. Okay. So e yeah e just moved forward one time, and that's it. I I think that's all that happened. Oh now it's turning. Okay. It's yeah. Moving. Turning. Yeah. Now it's moving. I guess, okay. yeah. So uh, this is the first time we are trying any robot programming. Uh, I wanted to ask, you know, this robot. If you put a, if you put a, a marker, it it makes it marks on the flat surface, right? So do we have any kind of a of a, a reverse coding where I can mark some stars, and the robot follows the markers? And then it generates a code out of that. Um, so it's a little bit loud in here. So I didn't hear all of the question, but I think um, you can put a marker in the in the center of the robot, and you can definitely use you you can write a, a program that would draw a star um, if that's if that's what the question was. So that's definitely something you can do with the robot. No, no. My question was uh, 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 exact opposite. So while I was, you know, evaluating uh, which robot to buy, you know, I selected Finch also, but I do not remember another robot in the market. But uh, it it was saying that you know you draw you draw some marks, you mark it on the flat surface, and the robot follows that. So if uh -oh. I draw a zigzag. Yes, I think yeah. I know what you're what you're talking about. So, um, so that's a, a line following capability. Yes. And so, with the Finch, there is some line following capability. It can follow a like a thick black line that you would put down with electrical tape, or maybe you would draw it with a with a sharpie or something like that. Um, there are other robots. I think Ozobot is probably the the one that maybe comes to mind when it comes to line following where they have some um, some line following capability where they also detect the color of the line. And so they do some, some interesting things with that to kind of tell your robot to do different things based on the color of the line. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. So my question was, so assume I draw a square uh, with a, a square and I put my robot in that square, it starts following. So effectively, you know, the code is, you move, move 20, turn 90, move 20, turn 90, move 20, turn 90, that's four times. So yeah. if, I, if I let the robot move over that square, uh, does it generate a code something like, you know, if we would have written the code and the robot would have drawn a square, now the reverse, if, if I let the robot move over the square, does we does it generate a code with, with 
which generates a square you you understand anta you understand what i'm asking does it generate um so does it generate a, a code that um that makes like no so yeah like a robot coding i draw a square i let the robot move over the square so does it generate a code a robot code that okay this was this is what the code was oh so no i don't think that would be i mean certainly not out of the box um okay. yeah i think you may be able to create a program where it draws a square and then it also um well the line tracking capability of the finch you generally want rounded corners to your to your line so it wouldn't be able to follow a square anyway but that's um, okay yeah okay thanks all right man. well um just want to go back to the slide deck and uh, sorry, Alt one. All right. So um, you know, thank you for coming this evening and trying out the robots, um, participating in this kind of novel, uh, socially distanced way of doing physical computing. Um, if you would like to try a Finch, we have a demo form here. Again, we, um, we plan to be shipping them next month. So demos will probably, they'll go out after pre-orders, but they probably will be going out within, within four to six weeks. Uh, again, here are our slides and here are just some links to the overview about the Finch, um, where to purchase. And if you want to learn more about um, kind of new developments like the Finch smartphone holder or more events like this one, uh, please sign up for our mailing list. Again, Aparna mentioned we are a tiny company. Um, so the way we grow is through word of mouth. So please let uh, anybody you know who might be interested in a future Finch playground or just in the Finch robot generally um, or in creative robotics generally, let them know about us. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming. Aparna, uh, if you want to say a few last words and stop the recording, and then we can hang around for any uh, off the record questions, I guess. Yes, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking time out of your evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. And um, we would just, we would really like to reiterate what Tom said. We really, really appreciate um, your patience and your trust in us trying to develop a product that's really good for you and your students. And um, we really appreciate it when you share information about us with all of your, your friends. And um, so thank you, I'm gonna stop the recording and we will stay around if anyone has any other questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait to see what you make on social media. On Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you can tag at birdbraintech or hashtag hummingbirdkit, or you can even tag me. If you have any questions, be sure to email us, info at birdbraintechnologies.com. We can answer questions about purchasing, about learning, about teaching, and about professional development. If you haven't been there yet, be sure to visit our Robotics at Home page. There, you can purchase a kit for yourself, learn how to use it, and even join one of our upcoming webinars. Until we see you in class, Thanks for watching from everyone at BirdBrain Technologies.